So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, the argument that I have made in the Yaqeen article that came out in November 2019, of course, I had thought about that article and that uh, case uh, for some 20 years that I've been working on this uh, question of Islamic political thought. Um, and there I made the case that the political unification of the Muslim Ummah in um, not merely sentimental and religious or spiritual solidarity, but political solidarity uh, is a religious obligation, something that I, I lay out that case in my article, but also it is an urgent need and it is uh, a feasible goal. Attaining such solidarity at social, economic, military, cultural, and political levels is not only important, but current under current circumstances, both an urgent task and but also I think particularly feasible. I argue um, that in a, we live we're living the age of deglobalization, environmental collapse, um, and um, cultural nativism uh, rising in the West. Major changes that many scholars argue that are not not like a 20 year flood or 100 year flood, but they're more like a 500 year flood in human events. And that uh, we ought to prepare ourselves to respond to uh, think, respond to these events, thinking about the next couple hundred years rather than, uh, you know, uh, year to year and, and, and month to month as uh, many of us uh, are, are forced to think given the events um, and many tragedies that we live. Um, so, what I here simply want to reiterate, but I think are key takeaways from that article, apart from the extensive case I made uh, for some of the conceptual tools, such as scholarly consensus or the idea of asymptotic ideal and the idea that the caliphate is not merely a political uh, arrangement, but also an aspiration and a place in Muslim imagination so that even after such a political system may be achieved, it is something that must be a fixture the ideal must be a fixture in our political, in our religious thinking, so that thinking about legitimate government, accountable government, thinking about the ummah, those are things that should be as much part of Muslim thinking um, as, uh, you know, rules about barul uh, walidain or, um, you know, making wudu, those are things that, of course, that are part of the religious discourse have always been. There are certain things that have been, that are religiously quite important in the Quran and in the Sunnah, but they have become over time less important for historical reasons that I discuss uh, in my book in 2012 um, publication. Um, so, the argument, the, the, the pro two propositions that I make, one, that uh, we all look for religious and social reforms and we identify many problems in Muslim societies and or in Islamic tradition. But I think that problems ranging from these moral, religious corruption, violence, injustice against the weak and underprivileged at all different levels uh, in Muslim societies and Muslim communities and Muslim households. Um, we see those problems and, and some of them can be traced to theoretical, some to institutional, uh, traditional and, and, and some to um, Sort of behavioral problems that we have absorbed uh, over the last century or so. And I argue that, um, and then of course you have the defense of persecuted Muslim minorities, the number of which is going up uh, drastically, and other acute pathologies and traumas that afflict Muslims, I argue that cannot be overcome or resolved except within a legitimate Islamic political framework that transcends the current prevailing nation state model. So here I'm making the argument that our personal, spiritual, religious, moral, uh, as well as communal lives are, are into, into integrally connected to our political well-being as well. The second, uh, of course, this proposition is well known since Aristotle and Plato to human thought. Uh, the second proposition I wish to highlight also is that there, that such an institution will not in itself eliminate all these problems. So rather than, rather it will likely facilitate their amelioration or even resolution, whereas without unity and political legitimacy, each one is aggravating, pushing us toward the punishment that Allah inflicted on the Israelites, as Allah says in Surah Al-A'raf, فِي الْأَرْضِ أُمَمَةً 
we seem to be going down that route. So that a legitimate political order that transcends the current plethora of sovereign nation states um, and secures Muslims effective cooperation in areas such as defense economy and governance is a necessary but not sufficient condition for the revival of Islam and completion and sustainability of certain crucial reforms. I choose to call this project OMATIC. Um, this is a term that I defend in my 2012 book. The idea being that really it's thinking about the Ummah is the essence of Islamic politics, just as thinking about the polis, the city was where the word political comes from for the Greeks. Um, so to say omatic political thought is somewhat of redundancy because really it's omatic thought. But nonetheless, omatic political thought, I think, has certain logic to it because um, thinking about the Ummah, but also thinking about the, the, the territorial, territorial um, the territory that the Ummah must therefore govern um, and, and almost uh, accept the fact that there are people uh, living within us that are not part of the believing Ummah, but nonetheless, they are part of the political Ummah, that they're non-Muslims. Similarly, we also embrace uh, and deal with the fact that there are, that Ummah is not always politically united. There are uh, Muslims living outside. And those were things that uh, were dealt with early on in Islamic history and concepts such as Darul Islam, Darul Kufr and others, Darul Harb, Darul Dawa, others that are, have been invented to deal with some of them. So uh, why call such, a, such an imagined future entity the caliphate? I think you know, provide some justification for that. It's not, of course, self-evident. People would say, why not talk about Islamic State or some kind of Muslim Union like European Union? But I argue that there is a need uh, for us to, um, uh, to use uh, power, the power of history, memory, and, uh, and the need for authenticity and continuity to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are uh, sometimes more compelling needs and more compelling argument than any rational or cerebral case we might make for it. Um, I argue that there are new threats and opportunities that I pointed out. Um, and um, also I uh, say that I'm going to just list the, the paragraphs as I have named them. Paragraph D, the caliphate's past. Um, I know that there have been various forms of the caliphate, and so it's not a given recipe. Uh, but nonetheless, there is enough uh, in agreed upon Islamic political uh, jurisprudence uh, and, and norms that, um, that require a certain political form. So that one could say that, yes, there is a great flexibility in Islam in what particular tools, what particular arrangements we might use, how power might be distributed, yet at the same time, um, what is non-negotiable, it seems to me, in Islamic tradition is that we are talking about loyalty to the Ummah, governance of the Ummah. And that is something that, of course, is necessarily lost in the current nation state model. Um, in my article, um, I provide a very brief and unsatisfactory account of the past and existing efforts on the caliphate. That was not the main point of the article, but of course, going forward, any such effort will have to uh, learn from existing efforts and critique them in a close fashion. Um, I, in, I think that what I'm really looking to highlight here uh, is paragraphs F, um, and G, uh, uh, moving forward, and, and beyond that, crucial points of debate among the Islamic movements that have been committed to Islamizing politics, such as gradualism, right? There are people who say that, well, first you establish the family and community and then um, fix your nation states and then move toward a unification, whereas this approach has been crit critiqued as well. People talk about bottom-up or top-down states uh, approaches to to major change. Um, the, the relationship to the West as a political other or as a potential friend um, with whom we seek this uh, coexistence, not complete assimilation, but not clash either. Those are, I think, important uh, points of debate. 
that need to be uh, continually and, and uh, dealt with in a renewed uh, with, with renewed attention. The relationship to Western bodies of knowledge and institutions. This I think is extremely important, and many existing scholars um, have dismissed Western bodies of knowledge uh, or bodies of knowledge as Western. Uh, yet at the same time, they're both compelling and they're not particularly Western. And I think that um, uh, dismissing them often uh, puts us uh, at a great disadvantage. Um, so we must have a uh, mastery of uh, of certain uh, empirical and uh, data and experiences and and, and fields of um, understanding uh, in politics society. Uh, otherwise, we are un incapable of deconstructing, and this almost a it's a fashionable decolonial anti-colonial uh, third third world this world this approach among Muslim intellectuals. Often leads to a, a new, well, to put the words that I usually use, it leads to a new God. That so anti modernity becomes a new God that we worship rather than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being able to, um, uh, you know, it, it becomes a new kind of religion where uh, we have to romanticize the past against the present. And I think that those are things that. Uh, ought to be addressed um, when thinking about uh, these future problems. The mechanisms of bringing about change, that's another thing, right? People focus on uh, bottom up or top down, uh, the relationship to non-Muslim citizens and subjects, uh, as well as uh, non-Muslim interlocutors. That's another thing that hasn't been sufficiently, sufficiently addressed. Uh, the question of how to organize uh, how such an, uh, such a body would be organized? Would, would it be a pure um, sort of model from the past um, or something made up of existing elements uh, of the present? So those are some of the points that um, I think that uh, going forward, such an effort uh, will have to necessarily engage. And I do not uh, pretend even to, to have addressed them in a satisfactory way in my article. Um, I want to also point out in uh, the next paragraph, point G, why a new effort, um, my vision of why I think that a new uh, effort is needed. You're all here because well, you recognize that it is both uh, needed and it's possible to have such a discussion, but to articulate them. Um, my point here is to explore the how of how to get there. Uh, collectively, how to actualize a nomadic political vision that addresses the aforementioned questions um, in such a way that is characterized by these few features that I think may be missing or not fully present in uh, the current and past caliphate movements. One, what is realistic and it speaks, speaks to historical complexities as well as social uh, and scientific bodies of knowledge available to us today. Many of the uh, articulations of an omatic vision in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, uh, I think are uh, to some degree a base. They were, they were sort of post World War uh, developmentalist model uh, in the world where IMF basically was uh, focusing on state based progress, state based development, and many of these movements uh, sought to look at the world and their own organization of movements as political parties. And so they're very centralized, they were top down. I think that those are things that uh, af uh, that need to be uh, reviewed and we need to, uh, new, and new articulation of the caliphate needs to also engage with our history, uh, history of the caliphate and political lessons that we learn. Second, um, and this is an important thing for me as uh, not only a goal, but almost as a measure of how well we're doing, which is that such an effort should speak equally to the various strata of Muslim life, meaning um, are we engaging only the energetic young men who are most easily attracted to audacious 
optimism, right? And of course, talking about the caliphate requires this kind of audacity. But um, also, if you're not engaging uh, nursing mothers and aging grandparents and community leaders and activists, dedicated academics and scholars, school teachers, university professors who are committed to uh, Islam and committed to the um, uh, and committed to Ummah centered political thinking, but might see, um, you know, uh, might provide us more sort of more realistic, more grain, granular, textured understanding of how change might occur. We are failing if you're not engaging all these types of uh, groups of people um, in the Ummah. Um, similarly, efforts I think should be made to include in the conversation sympathetic non-Muslims within the Muslim lands uh, and outside of it. Finally, such a discourse should not be limited to restoring a political institution, but worthy of a permanent place in Islamic thought and life. So those were um, some of the things that I want to see as features of our intellectual movement and whatever social movement that may come out of it. Um, and then I will skip the next two paragraphs, the movement, the kind, you know, I, I try to describe the movement that we need and uh, some envision, how I envision the caliphal governance to be. Those are things that will necessarily be more uh, practical questions um, that will have to be treated by uh, subgroups among us and uh, many other um, future scholars and endeavors who uh, want to take up the project. So I will get to just the next steps, paragraph J. I propose that we hold another colloquium in two or three months in which two or three uh, other scholars will present their uh, views just as I have done mine um, in this session and then we similarly build on it, critique it. And finally, we also take step towards establishing a center for a research or a think tank um, and or a website uh, to advance uh, what I have called a political thought practice. <laughs>